Um, the United States, unfortunately, and I've uh, spent a third of my life there, <laughs> so as the saying goes, all my friends are American. And what I've learned from the Americans is that in the policy context, uh, foreign policy context, that the national interest is about everything else. And national interest, not in terms of how India has always defined it in many universal terms, a nuclear free world and so on and so forth, but in very narrow terms as to whether or not your interests are served in the here and now and in the immediate future. Um, America is an extremely unreliable partner. There's a history of it I don't want to get into, uh, but you know, you have, uh, I've written books on the unreliability of America as a partner. It's good to have America on your side, um, only because to the extent that our interests converge, it may be in containing China. But that said, for us to rely on the United States as some kind of a central pillar for our future approach to China would be a great, great mistake. And after all, it's not just Trump. Trump has just been more vocal about it. But think of what Obama uh, said. I mean, his first instincts were to set up a condominium with China. I mean, it was not to have democracies and who share values and all that nonsense, uh, you know, shared values. It counts for nothing in the world. Uh, your immediate national interest, even if you have to sup with the devil, you will do so. I mean, in realpolitik, that's what you do. There's no idealistic, ideal politic here involved because then you should not be in politics. Uh, and I always wondered why it is that the Indian government and Indian rulers and elected rulers who are ruthless in domestic politics turn into uh, billy cats when it comes to foreign policy. I wish they had shown the same ruthlessness abroad, in dealing with China, for instance. I mean, after all, what would make a greater impact on China? I've always said, and I've been advocating for years together, uh, the simple thing of paying back China in the same coin. They have gone about deliberately to discomfort, strategically discomfort India over the years by, for instance, nuclear missile arming Pakistan. I have, in my interface with the government over the years, at the highest levels, said, why don't we return the favor by nuclear missile arming Vietnam? Finally, we've gotten the gumption up to at least send the Brahmos missile uh, to Vietnam. And then, uh, to our dismay, find that the uh, Hanoi government are simply so sick and tired of Indian uh, procrastination, or so simple a decision of sending a Brahmos missile. Brahmos is a cruise missile supersonic which is indefensible. If you fire a, a two, uh, two Brahmos missiles on a broadside, it will bring down the aircraft carrier Leonin or any other damn thing that ventures into its range. So this is the kind of stuff that we should have thought about long back. If you start with the Brahmos, fine, but go on ahead and nuclear missile arm um, the states on Chinese periphery. By the way, this is what I've said in 1.5 track to the Chinese, and they've literally been appalled at what I've said, quite apart from our Indian officials here being appalled by what I've said. But this is the way to do it. I mean, after all, consider this. A Brahmos is just sufficient to keep the, um, the powerful uh, South Fleet of the Chinese Navy in the Sanya base. If you, you give it to the Vietnamese who have given us a base for use, but we are not moving ahead with it, this is our problem. We just talk and talk and talk. We are not uh, karmi yogis, we are uh, karmi talkers. You know? Uh, we just talk, 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 and just tire our friends and would-be partners. Do nothing over the years. We just talk. And so that's therefore, you know, I, I, I despair at the prospects of India doing anything, even if it comes and hits you in the face. Uh, so um, that's it. The point is America is not a reliable partner. History, and again, I can go on down um, why it won't. All, all that... Trump's America, for instance, is interested in, is selling you antiquated 1960s aircraft and let nobody tell you differently. If you put on some as 1960s aircraft of the F-16 or F-18 vintage and dress it up with bells and whistles, it's still a 1960s aircraft when it comes to agility and the plan form. 
you can have a BVR missile beyond visual range missile arm the uh, thing because and the military is my thing and I'm telling you that if you talk to the uh, Indian Air Force that you know pilots who test pilots who have doing the MMRCA sweepstakes flew the F-16 and so on they came back saying you know this is a ridiculous aircraft to buy and that's why the first aircraft that were rejected in the medium multi uh, role combat aircraft sweep, you know, sweepstakes that Rafad was selected for were the F-16 and F-18. They rejected out of hand. Now, Trump is coming in through the back door to sell us this wretched aircraft and giving a song and story about how, you know, there are so many aircraft and this, that, and the other. Not true. There's sufficient material all out in the public realm to suggest that this is a commercial relationship which they want. They would have otherwise had to scrap and trash and junk the F-16 line at Fort Worth, Texas. Instead, they're going to sell it for billions of dollars to India. So yes, I mean, W.C. Fields, uh, you can find a sucker every time, right? I mean, in business, you guys should know. I mean, what, what after all is, you know, in business, everybody talks about how being disruptive is good for business, right? Being disruptive in business, having a new model, disruptive of the extant order. Um, how come does, does not, in your mind, apply to international relations? It does apply, but we choose to be responsible. Responsible means what? Tag onto someone else's uh, coattails or climb onto some bandwagon, and we've always done so. And this, uh, this has been our problem, and why India is really not making it, and if we go on in this, in this line, won't make it in the future. Very, very well put points. In fact, I agree with you. Excellent point. This is a very informed audience, and I think now the debate as it is heating up, and I'll uh, just come to you in a moment, Pramit. I fully agree with you, Bharat. We have, uh, we have not been courageous enough in geopolitics, and we have hidden our lack of courage with other uh, hypocritical virtues. In fact, my study shows that this uh, term, Atiti Devo Bhava, it became most popular during those centuries when the invasions were becoming more and more. So we could not handle the Akraman Kari. We told him, Atiti Devo Bhava. He was mo marching into our uh, drawing room. So we were dressing up our base deficiencies in godly virtues. So I fully agree with you. Uh, however, I would now like to sharpen the debate between uh, you and uh, uh, Pramit. Uh, Pramit, what? Bharat has said it, don't do what the Americans preach. Do what they do. They are extremely real politics savvy, self-centered administration country. That is one point. I would like to have your comments on this. And the second is, he said that Doklam war was one off. Do you agree with this or you feel it was a turning point? Um, okay, well, first on the Americans, I agree. America is unreliable insofar as any great power is unreliable, as is we are, incidentally. If you go to Bangladesh, you go to any country that has dealt with us, there was a long litany of complaints about how India has gone back and forth, never fulfilled its promises. I once went to Myanmar with Manmohan Singh, uh, where, where we did our, essentially began a renewable our relationship uh, with uh, with Myanmar, um, and I remember we you know we made a normal set of announcements about what we were going to do, and I met some Burmese officials, and I said, so what's your view on this? They looked at it and they said, since 1950, India has never fulfilled a single promise you have made to our country, not one, no road, no dam, no port, no military equipment, nothing. You have the worst record of any country we've ever dealt with diplomatically because you've kept changing your positions and what you say now, six months later you change your view. Um, now we can go into why, but the point is all governments, all superpowers, any, and a superpower in particular will do this, but great powers generally change their positions quite radically. The game is that for a large country, especially one like the United States, is try to get a sense of what their overriding geopolitical interest is, see where you converge, ride as long as you can with it, but understand that this is going to change. Um, and then exploit what you can out of it. They play the same game and they assume this other side will do the same thing. So for example, 
Uh, we had a very good relationship with the, at the height of our relationship historically with the U.S. was in the late Eisenhower Kennedy period. It wasn't built on any Kennedy Nehru relationship. It was built on a common concern about communist China, under a, a Maoist China. We see it collapse under uh, under the Johnson administration, not because LBJ and Nehru didn't like each other. It was because Vietnam consumed the United States and they expected India to join and they were not prepared to give us the defense arrangement that they were had given, they were wanted to do with Pakistan because they said we can't give it to both of you. So India said, well, screw you, then we're off to the Soviet Union. Um, then the relationship deteriorates and reaches its, its, its nadir under Nixon because he sees China and he uses China strategically against their primary enemy, Soviet Union. Soviet Union's collapse. We then move back closer to the United States uh, because we need a source of weapons. The Soviet Union had collapsed, and especially during the Yeltsin period, it was incapable of almost giving anything or didn't want to give us anything uh, at that point. So, for example, we resumed our relationship with Israel, which we had basically you know, thrown in, into, into a garbage bin years ago, um, and we went back to the United States. Uh, and it's gone back and forth since then. Uh, so under Bush, we see a man who, did, you know, and I've met Bush, deeply, deeply disliked China uh, and saw India as the country that he was prepared to do pretty much almost anything he wanted, uh, India wanted. Um, then we had, as, as, as Bharat has correctly said, Obama who comes in and as a good liberal internationalist thinks what I should really be doing is trying to cooperate with China on 